Most people believe that Henry Ford kicked it all off with his invention of the modern, at that time, production line making cars affordable to all. He didn't. That actually was the byproduct. The much more dramatic and impactful change, a true paradigm shift that he caused, was to invent the concept of everybody owning their own personal form of transport. You see, before then, relatively few people owned horses or boats. They simply hired them when needed. What Henry Ford did was to tell people that at last they could own their own form of transport, a totally novel idea up until then. The production line merely made it affordable for most people to be able to buy one of the new super cheap cars. This exact paradigm shift in ownership concept was repeated recently in the late 20th century when Bill Gates said that one day every home would have a computer. He was laughed at. Up until then, the idea of owning a full room-sized computer costing tens of thousands of pounds and needing a degree in computer language to operate was just plain ludicrous and not needed. Who needs a computer? He invented the concept when he invented the first home computer at a really affordable price, his equivalent of the production line. Oh, how IBM wished they'd listened to him. I'm Dave and I'm looking into where we're going to go next with EVs. Change is a constant, although that's probably an oxymoron. But think back to your childhood days. For me, growing up in Liverpool, it was Ford and Vauxhall factories. That was it. Massive great production lines that employed tens of thousands of people on very good wages. And outside Liverpool, we have Dagenham and Luton. Even larger factories also employing tens of thousands and churning out millions of brand new cars. And employment didn't stop there. There were dealerships that were needed, and then they themselves needed new car delivery drivers to fetch their stock. Plus the knock-on benefits of having tens of thousands of very well-paid workers looking for something to spend their money on. Hence the invention of things like the package holiday. These workers needed a break after all. But the skyline was Ford, Vauxhall and ultimately British Leyland. But then came the first of the Japanese cars, the Datsuns, the Hondas, and the very first one, the Daihatsu Companio Berlina. They were rubbish, rust buckets that didn't look like proper cars, but they did have a massive list of essentials sorely missing from UK cars. Clock, cigarette lighter, reclining front seats, reversing lights, three-speed fans, electric windscreen washers, and even a radio. Now, while many of these, as individual items, were already knocking around, they'd never before all been included in one car, certainly not at the budget end of the market. But they very quickly changed the design, and they soon learned what we wanted our cars to look like. And, more importantly, they knew that we wanted them to be more reliable. 1960s Fords and Vauxhalls were not the most reliable cars ever made. From there, we saw a veritable Japanese flood that was launched onto the UK car market. And that was one of the largest in the world at that time. From there, the rest is history. Well, but it isn't. Because the UK ended up not only a very large market, but also an ideal base to set up manufacturing from for the, China, for the Japanese to tackle the European market. Tariffs existed back then, and a manufacturing facility in the UK meant free access to Europe. We were members of the European Union, if you remember. Honda formed a union with British Leyland at the time. Well, they actually bought them out of failing British industry and set up joint factories which they ran. Many of those exist to this day. But slowly at first a giant of a car manufacturer appeared in the form of Toyota, eclipsed everything. Now we in the UK pretty much surrendered our entire motor industry after far too many bailouts pouring supposedly good money after bad and the Japanese just set about taking over. Europe, on the other hand, didn't give up. They set about building their own competitor in the form of the VW Group to beat them at their own game. That group grew over the years, adding Audi in the 60s and Porsche as late as 2012, although it had a major stakeholding before then, following an agreement in 2009. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs were at stake. We, the customers, just accepted these Japanese cars, and in time, 
many of us came to prefer them. So the Fords and Vauxhalls began to disappear into the background, fading further with each passing year. Toyota and VW battled it out for supremacy at the top of the league. America was different, but only in that they'd made two dramatic decisions. First, they'd virtually given up on making cars, and they all knuckled down to make the bigger, far more profitable, better and flashier pickup trucks. Secondly, they welcomed, indeed encouraged, the Japanese to set up factories in America, employing American workers to make those cars. And it all worked. All the major Japanese manufacturers now have massive manufacturing facilities in America. But all good things must come to an end. Nothing we make lasts forever, and the car manufacturers reached that peak back in 2016. It was a self-created peak because they had become so good at making cars, making them reliable and safer, they now gave us warranties that commonly extended to four or five years, others going up to an amazing 10 years. The biggest buyer of new cars, the commercial fleet, no longer had to trade them in after two years. That difference alone simply destroyed the idea of even maintaining, let alone growing, the same number of new car sales into the future. But they all believed they could. Now, with various credit crunches, private buyers also began hanging on to the cars for far longer. The market had reached its peak and never could recover those new sales levels. Price cuts, interest-free credit offers, leases, they all appeared to try to get more people buying, even down to the subprime mortgage scandal where anyone who could just about sign their name, even some who couldn't, could get a car loan. Now, we all know how that ended in the in the banking crash of 2008, but the market had already moved on. It was a different world into which Tesla introduced something totally different. A family saloon car that ordinary people could afford, which outperformed a Ferrari, could drive itself to a limited extent, but ran on laptop batteries that could be charged at home for less than the price of a cup of coffee. And it's totally re-energised the market. Far from those that don't like EVs complaining about them, some of them should be thankful because the ice market had already collapsed 10 years ago and is still nowhere near that peak. Without EVs, many of the car giants would already be totally out of business. But change is here once again. Massive names like Toyota and Ford and Vauxhall just fade into obscurity. No, Probably not fade is the best word. More like leaving a massive explosion of the greatest debt in the world's history. Enron, that previously held the world record with a mere 15 billion bankruptcy, 30 billion if you include all the ancillary losses, that's almost just exactly what it cost VW to pay out in the Dieselgate standard. But that is only a tiny fraction of their total debt, which stands at over 200 billion, the largest in the world ever. But out of the ashes rises the phoenix, so we see Tesla, BYD, names were totally unknown 15 years ago. Yeah, just 15 years ago, neither one had made their first commercial EV. Hybrids, yeah, they, that happened about 10 years earlier, and GM had a dabble with the EV1, as did VW with the e-Golf, but you can't count EV1's 1,000 total production run, nor about 20,000 e-Golfs a year, when VW was making best part of 10 million cars a year. In 2000, China set a nationwide policy to go electric, offered billions in loans, grants and guarantees to EV manufacturers and battery manufacturers. It's been building up the knowledge, expertise, technology and experience to be able to make really great EVs and also a supply chain to feed it with raw materials all sourced from within China. So the scene was set, with the old school desperately clinging on to the past, resorting to any and all often illegal and immoral acts if necessary, dieselgate and subprime loans. But the battle's lost and the new replacement Fords and Vauxhalls, they're already here, BYD and Tesla. Between them, they dominate the EV world. For any who read the wrong sort of news and think Tesla's going bust, Tesla's back up on top. This year, to date, number one, number three bestseller in Europe, one and two bestseller in the US, one and two bestseller in the world with the Model Y and the Model 3. In China, the Model Y is third place uh, behind two small budget cars which you can buy with a credit card. Record sales, record sales after many months of quieter times and running expansion programs that Legacy Auto could only dream of. 
BYD, a name few had heard of just a few years ago, is now at the top of the list for many EV buyers, fighting head to head with Tesla for world domination. Tesla got there a few years earlier. Now, please don't forget that all those claims EVs are too expensive. Uh, the average price of all new cars in the UK in 2025 is £35,000. The Tesla Model 3 starts at 39, Model Y 45. And the Model 3 briefly took the top selling car in the world title last year, toppling both VW and Toyota petrol efforts. So our traditional heritage factories like Ford, Vauxhall, VW, they're already disappearing. VW will be laying off tens of thousands of staff and closing several factories in the next few years. The others are also well along the way to shedding both workers and unwanted factories. In the place will come the likes of BYD and Tesla, but on the horizon there's a multitude of others that are just making themselves known, but not yet in the big time. We've got Xpeng, Neo, JQ, Omoda, uh, Xiaomi, G GWM, to name just a few. Some might not break into the mainstream, some might go bust, while others might end up like Toyota and take over the world, new EV sales in time. Whatever happens, the look of our factories and dealer showrooms has already changed and will continue to change over the next few years. But don't be surprised if some simply disappear. Ford Europe, for example, is only little better financed than VW. And if Ford America pulls all support, it's unlikely to be able to survive on its own. Likewise, Stellantis, it's a conglomeration of several uh, separate brands. And if Stellantis itself is threatened, it's quite likely to just ditch those uh, threatened br brands and carry on with the rest. Now, before anyone else suggests they should just sell the unwanted factories, please let me know in the comments down below who's likely to pay top dollar for a failed factory. Who in the right mind will buy a failed factory at any price? The answer is just the Chinese trying to get a foothold into the European market to avoid tariffs. And they will definitely not pay top price if the very first thing they have to do is rip out all the old existing antiquated equipment and install their own brand new. The factory will be valued at the price for a burr factory. And don't forget, this might be the first of 10, 20 or more factory sales coming up. That seriously devalues them into the future. Well, finally, we come to the elephant in the room and an even more dramatic potential paradigm shift. This is full self-driving and robocabs. Now, it was only just over a hundred years ago, we never owned our own transport. If we needed a wagon and horses, we hired them. If we needed to get across a river, we booked a water taxi. If we needed to get into town, we booked a handsome cab. If we wanted to go further, we booked a seat on a stagecoach. That was the way we lived. Don't remember it. Later, of course, we made use of the first passenger railways. Now, to this day, for many journeys, we buy a ticket for a train, bus or coach. It is just so more convenient than maybe spending hours stuck in traffic, then having to go and find somewhere to park and pay for it. This dream of everyone owning their own personal transport was the norm that Henry Ford shattered. This dream of everyone owning their own personal transport was the norm before Henry Ford shattered it. What if we're going to go back there? That would be a monster paradigm shift, but before you dismiss it, dismiss it let me give you one fact. 4.2 million people use the railway each day in the UK in 2025. Another fact, an incredible 10 million travel using buses. Then Uber, for example, states they carry over 5 million passengers a day and other taxis appear to carry a few million. I know that some of these will have jumped off a train and used one simply to complete the journey, but others will be just using Uber for the whole trip. Now, this is not a new market because not one of these 15, 20 million people each day currently uses their privately owned car to get to work. Not one. Of the 32 million who do work, there must be several million who can walk, several million who get a lift. But the fact remains, there's an awful lot of people currently travel to and from work without using their private car. So don't get all defensive about uh, taking away your freedom. These people do not use a private car to get to work at the moment. OK, comment section must be winding up to full steam by now. Yes, full self-driving does not exist. I know that. But most people accept it will one day. That day might be tomorrow, next month, next year, next decade. Makes no difference when it happens.
When robocabs appear on the street with prices a tenth of that charged by the railway and bus networks and a quarter that charged by current taxis and rideshare, the initial market is simply those that already travel each day by public transport. They will switch purely on price but will be massively swayed by convenience. You might, have a, you might have to get a lift to the railway station, take the train, get off at the nearest stop to where you're going, maybe miles away, then catch an Uber. How much more convenient would it be if those people could book a robocab to arrive at their home, pick them up and drop them off at work or wherever they're going, right outside the front door? Once again, for the comments section in this scenario, I've not asked a single motorist to stop driving. These people already using public transport, not their cars in their daily commute. So don't start shouting about taking our cars or freedom away from us. The initial market for the RoboTab might just be aimed at taking some of them off the trains and buses and putting them into RoboCabs. That's certainly many millions. 10 million bus riders, for example. It's absolutely huge. Now, for the next target, there are millions of motorists who do drive, but hate driving in rush hour every day, crawling from traffic light to roundabout, then having to circle round, find somewhere to park, and then having to pay for it. Many of them cannot take public transport. Some because it doesn't physically exist, and some because the public transport is so ridiculously more expensive. If they were offered an alternative that did exist and was considerably cheaper and more convenient than using their own car, how many of them were going to take that option? Well, finally, we have all the other motorists, including the diehard motorists who love the freedom, and for them, they'll never voluntarily give them up. But for the rest, especially those who switch to robocabs for the daily commute, they might well go on to use them at the weekend to go and visit Aunt Gladys. When their lease or finance is up on their owned car, how many are going to rush out to spend tens of thousands of pounds on a new car? that is now going to sit out on their drive for 95% of the time. You see, we've not yet caught on to the idea of just how massive a paradigm shift this will bring. In effect, taking us back to when it was the exception to own your own transport. But there's a massive education process needed before then. See, many people now call an Uber to send their precious daughter off to meet her mates or to ballet or whatever they do. But how much safer would it be if there wasn't a middle-aged male sitting uh, in the driving seat taking her there? Likewise, lads going out for a drink. No more designated drivers. Everyone can, if they so wish, get blind drunk and get bundled into a robocab at the end of the night. We simply have scratched the surface to think these are just going to be used as car replacements. How about cottage industry that previously used DHL or Parcel Force, but now at the end of the day just books a uh, robocab to personally deliver their parcels to each of their customers? Or getting a single robocab to, a robocab to do the rounds, picking up guests for a stag night, and then delivering them back home at the end? Well, until now, none of that has been possible, but Uber and Waymo, full self-driving cars, they're already on the road in America. They're quite a common sight. I bet you didn't know that Uber, full self-drive EVs, carry out about 33 million trips per day in America. So those who say, well, it's, not, it's no longer possible. In actual fact, it is possible. It's just merely not yet developed enough to give us that paradigm shift. So my message is, with those who say it cannot be done, please get out of the way of those of us already doing it. I'm done.